Kevin explained to Bahidi that the treasure vault hidden under the abandoned theater would contain knowledge that could save the world from destruction. Bahidi stopped her own search for the treasure, but her raiders were angry she was giving up their share of the bounty. A fight broke out, and from her hiding place in the rafters, Madame Spatzel joined in by dropping stage lights on the raiders below. One of the raiders trapped her on the rafters, and Kevin looked up just in time to see Madame Spatzel being tossed toward imminent death. Kevin quickly elbowed the large raider he was fighting in the neck, leaving him gasping for breath. Though he was yards away, Kevin dove onto the stage in time to snatch Madame Spatzel out of the air just before she hit the floor. After they tumbled to a stop, Madame Spatzel looked up at him and said, I've never been more attracted to you than I am right now. Good to know, but you know my heart only belongs to one that as he helped her to her feet. Madame Spatzel sighed. That makes you even more alluring. Lily is the world's luckiest woman. Kevin heard a rustling from above his head. He looked up to see the raider who had seconds before tried to throw Madame Spatzel to her death, now peering down at them from the rafter with a worried look on his face. The raider frantically looked around for an escape, but much like the raider had just done to Madame Spatzel, Kevin speedily climbed the rigging and closed in on him. This time, the raider was the prey. He futilely put his hands up and begged, No, please, I don't want to die. You should have thought of that before trying to take another life, Kevin said coldly before he roughly picked him up and forcefully threw him down to the stage floor. Unlike for Madame Spatzel, there was no one there to catch him. Having witnessed enough of Kevin's destruction, the raiders who still had working legs fled from the theater. Bahidi pursed her lips and looked up at Kevin, who was still standing on the rafters. I'll see you on set, Kevin Williams she said calmly before exiting the theater. Well, that was fun, Darius said, dusting himself off. Should we go about finding this world-saving treasure then? Kevin, Darius, and Madame Spatzel each grabbed a jackhammer and started going to work on the space under the stage that Kevin had found. If any of them were hoping for it to be an easy task, they were sure to be disappointed. Hours passed with nothing discovered besides more bedrock. Madame Spatzel and Darius took their machinery to shatter and break through different parts of the theater, but they came up empty at every turn. After a few hours, Darius and Madame Spatzel returned to where Kevin was still drilling below the stage. Maybe we should turn in for the night, Darius suggested. The theater will still be here tomorrow. Just a little longer, Kevin insisted. It doesn't make sense that there are this many layers of concrete under the stage. Mere seconds after he had said it, Kevin's jackhammer slowed and started emitting the violent noise of metal on metal. Kevin shut it off and realized his tool had begun hitting a slab of copper. There's something here, Kevin said excitedly. Kevin used the jackhammer to remove the surrounding concrete, finally revealing a hatch in the floor, made entirely of copper. This is a door, Kevin exclaimed. This has to be it. Darius and Madame Spatzel excitedly sped over to the hole while Kevin removed hydrochloric acid from his satchel. He dissolved the bolts holding the hatch in place and removed the copper lid, revealing a dark stairwell descending below. Anyone want to turn back? Kevin asked. Not a chance, Madame Spatzel replied. Holding a flashlight out in front of him, Kevin led the way down the dark, damp stairs. Finally up ahead, he saw sparkling lights reflecting the beam of his flashlight. He reached the bottom of the stairs, which opened into a chamber full of treasures. Well, this definitely lives up to the height, Kevin said. Darius and Madame Spatzel followed him into the chamber and their jaws dropped. In front of them were piles of jewels, gold plates and goblets, and countless cultural artifacts. Darius rushed to the walls, where his eyes gleamed with admiration as he examined the gold-plated artwork and hieroglyphics. Madame Spatzel, meanwhile, was drawn to a golden lamp on a pedestal. It's a lamp for a genie, Madame Spatzel said reverently as she approached the piece. It probably would be a good idea not to touch anything until we fully search the place, Kevin advised. You want me to just leave a genie in there? Madame Spatzel asked indignantly. This could be our only chance of getting Robin Williams back. Ignoring Kevin's suggestion, Madame Spatzel rubbed the lamp, but 
But instead of a genie emerging, the lamp suddenly glowed with heat as a fiery engraving appeared on its side. Are these instructions for making my wishes come true? Madam Spencer wondered. Before Kevin or Darius could investigate, a statue in a dark corner, previously unnoticed by the three, lit up with the same engraving. Kevin studied the chiseled face carved in limestone. This must be Marinhor, Kevin said with wonder. As he examined the rest of the statue, he saw a hole in the chest perfectly shaped like the lamp. Madam Spatzel, put that lamp here, Kevin instructed. Okay, but just so we're all clear, when the genie comes out, I get all the wishes, Madam Spatzel replied. She placed the lamp in the cavity in the statue's chest and the engravings began to melt and swirl. Finally, the eyes of the statue alighted and a powerful voice filled the room. Long have I slumbered, waiting for the worthy to awaken me, Marinhor said. Kevin couldn't help but sneak an excited glance at Madame Spatzel and Darius, who looked back at him with confusion. They can't hear me, Marinhor told Kevin. Only the leveled few can hear my message. You know levels, Kevin asked, surprised. I am among the very first to attain them. Marinhor replied. Those who came after us have long wondered how we Egyptians accomplished all that we did. They said regular humans couldn't have possibly created such a civilization and couldn't have built the pyramids. And they were right. Kevin listened utterly spellbound. For all of his aspiring for mastery, he hadn't considered the origins of his powers. The highest order of us learned to communicate with animals and to master teleportation. Marinhor continued, The great masters of levels built the pyramids with telekinesis and learned to store our consciousness after our earthly deaths into an object. I housed my consciousness in a lamp. I was the guardian of too much wisdom to allow it to be buried with my body. So I left a puzzle behind so that someday I could pass my wisdom on to one who was worthy. So you've been waiting for thousands of years? Kevin asked in shock. I've spent that time exploring the potential of my mind and my soul. Marinhor explained. I've learned things that mortals couldn't even fathom. I've created elaborate worlds in my mind, guided them through evolution like a god. So I guess pharaohs considering themselves gods wasn't an exaggeration, Kevin replied. Some tended to exaggerate, Marinhor acknowledged, especially while still inhabiting their mortal bodies. But for those of us who continued our devotion to leveling, the line between mortal and divine has truly become blurred. What level have you reached? Kevin asked. Ninety-nine, Marinhor replied. Kevin's jaw practically fell on the floor. When I learned that level 10 was considered master, I assumed that was the end. Knowing what I've achieved only as a level seven, you're right. The mortal mind truly can't fathom it. How many levels are there? Levels are infinite, Marinhor replied. The levels are merely thresholds, waiting for the next pioneer to discover and create what comes next. You have not yet even explored the extent of your current level. Level 7 is when I first learned telekinesis. I'm capable of moving objects with my mind? Kevin asked with shock and excitement. The first step toward capability is self-belief in the capability, Marinhor instructed. Even now, you speak with me while your colleagues cannot. Have you ever communicated with the dead before? No. Kevin realized. But you believed you could communicate with me, and so you can, Marinhor replied. And so you now have achieved that level. Kevin certainly didn't realize this journey would result in new powers. Being able to communicate with those who had died opened up a whole new world of possibilities for him. Now, that goblet there, Marinhor continued. Don't try to move it. Simply believe you can. Kevin set his sights on the gold chalice that Marinhor indicated. Channeling his focus, he suddenly felt a different relationship to the goblet than he had ever considered with an inanimate object. 
It wants to work with me. It wants my guidance, Kevin thought. And he truly believed it. Now, move it, Baron Hor instructed. Kevin focused, feeling his energy transfer to the goblet. Suddenly, it tipped. Not a large movement, but just enough to prove that Kevin was capable. Whoa! Darius and Madame Spatzel said in unison, having not been privy to the rest of the conversation. Something to work on, Kevin said to Marinhor. And there's so much more, Marinhor continued. Teleportation at level 15, flying at level 20. So the ancient Egyptians achieved true superpowers, Kevin said with awe. How did you do it? Where did this practice even begin? We were the first of this world to engage with levels, Marinhor explained. But we had guides. Kevin leaned in, wondering if one of the great global conspiracies was about to be confirmed. The levels were taught to us, Marinhor continued, by the great ones who came to us from the sky, from another world. So it's true, Kevin thought. Aliens. Marinhor explained to Kevin that the ancient Egyptians were the first to attain levels, and he had reached level 99. He gave Kevin his earliest introduction to telekinesis and explained that due to their conversation, Kevin had achieved the power to communicate with the dead. To Kevin's shock, Marinhor also revealed that the true originators of levels were, it seems, aliens. Darius isn't going to believe me when I tell him this, Kevin thought. He could barely believe it himself. He now contained the knowledge that his levels actually connected him to otherworldly beings. Kevin realized that Marinhor, having achieved 99 levels and thus was a master many times over, must have been to the Upper Realm. Knowing that the Upper Realm was in tumult and that he had been asked with restoring it, Kevin knew it was a priority for him to question Marinhor further. Have you been to the Upper Realm as I and other masters have been, Kevin Marinhor? Of course. It is the place where one can distill his skills and find the meaning behind talents, Marinhor replied wisely. Kevin almost feared telling his undead source of wisdom about the chaos there, but he was compelled to do so. The Upper Realm and its gatekeeper, Alohi, are in turmoil. An evil source entered the terrain in the hope of destroying it forever and ending its ability to give greater power to those who have levels. I have been tasked with restoring it to its former self. Marinhor mused and spoke slowly. This is, indeed, a terrible situation. The search for the new gatekeeper has gone on for thousands of years and was always peaceful, and a process that evolved in a natural progression. I too was once tasked with helping to find the new gatekeeper from the seven young candidates who were ordained to go to the Upper Realm to be tested. Only one would rise to the occasion, but now I fear. Mirren Hor's voice fell away as his worries became too great for him. Kevin had to prod the long-dead pharaoh for more information, but Kevin still had much to learn and he needed to connect the bits of information he'd been learning from Mirren Hor from the Night King and from his vision quest in Hawaii, when he sought to learn about Alohi's own rise from being a child frolicking in the seas to being the exalted gatekeeper of the Upper Realm. Then he had learned tidbits about how Alohi had passed a test given to her and that the gatekeeper's destiny could be ordained by an obsidian mirror. But so little had yet been cemented in Kevin's mind. And yet he knew that the fate of so many rested on his ability to find clarity in his mission. How did you know how to conduct your search? Why were you handed the responsibility of finding the new gatekeeper? He asked quickly, but with such a desperate need for knowledge that it brought Marinhor back from the worries that had made him silent. There is always one who is beyond even those of us who have levels. There is also always one who is chosen. That was me thousands of years ago, and now it is you. You have seen chaos. Each chosen one always knows that it is possible that the upper realm could fall. Take the words of your mentor, take the information I have given you, and combine them with the trust that is in your heart. 
There are seven out there who must be found before the one, the new gatekeeper, can rise, and it must happen immediately. I fear for the world and its people if the current gatekeeper dies before the new one is found. The upper realm will die too, and so too will all. Again, Marinhor's voice and energy seemed to fade as he thought about the consequences of the chaos that was in the upper realm currently. Kevin could tell that Marinhor's energies were not inexhaustible and he still had more to learn from him. As much as Kevin wanted to know more about the Great Ones who had taught the Egyptians levels, and though he also knew he could ask more questions about his own assignment to find the new gatekeeper, Kevin had earthly issues to resolve. You have given me much to think about, and I know my responsibilities are great, Kevin said to Marinhor. In truth, there is a specific reason we wanted to talk to you. We found a series of hieroglyphics that no one in modern times has seen before. We didn't know how to translate them, and we have come here for information and guidance. Where were these hieroglyphics? Marinhor asked. Kevin described the symbols he had seen during the Eminence film in London. The chain link, the lizard, and the inverted all-seeing eye had all flashed across the screen and seemingly affected the audience members without their knowledge. I do know these hieroglyphics, Marinhor replied. While developing my levels, I learned how to construct entirely new languages. I was able to make hieroglyphics that didn't need to be read or interpreted, but when flashed at the subject at the right speed, would give them an instinctual understanding. The meaning behind the symbols could surpass cognitive analysis and sink into the subconscious. We use zoetropes to achieve this. This was a lot for Kevin to process, as he remembered his search for the Lumiere films and their introduction of a new type of film projector, a zoetrope which Kevin now realized was a reintroduction. The Egyptians were even innovators of what would have become modern cameras and projectors. The dots began to connect in Kevin's brilliant mind. However, these specific symbols you've described, Marinhor continued, I did not devise myself. Other leveled beings became aware of this possibility but had more evil intentions than the ease of interpersonal understanding. Some of my contemporaries sought the power of mind control. This was definitely alarming to Kevin. He had suspicions that Eminence had used the symbols as a sort of subconscious message, and Marinhor's words all but confirmed it now for Kevin. Marinhor continued his explanation. My vizier, second in command, wanted to overthrow me. He saw these hieroglyphics as a mean to turn my people against me, and he almost succeeded. He raised an army of citizens whom I didn't want to defeat in battle. They were my people, but they were not acting on their own accord. I was only able to disband them because I had a greater understanding of the subconscious language. I disabled the mind control and killed my vizier. He managed to transfer the consciousness into a lamp, but it would hopefully never be found. I'm afraid that it already has, Kevin mused. The hieroglyphics I described were inserted into a film. I don't know how the studio would have learned of them if not from the vizier who created them. Then that is of grave concern, Marinhor warned. As I said, those symbols are capable of raising an army. Thinking back to the audience's favorable response to the objectively terrible film, Kevin said, it seems that the film studio is only using mind control to garner favorable reception to their movies, but it's definitely something I need to look into. You say there is a way to reverse the effects of mind control. That gives me hope. Yes, but it is not easy, Marinhor said. You must go beyond simply mastering understanding of subliminal language. Removing what has become someone's intuitive understanding is much more difficult than implanting the idea in the first place. Kevin's mind raced. If Eminence succeeded in implementing mind control, Kevin wouldn't be able to stop them by force. He'd have to increase his own abilities, a process that in Kevin's experience had an unpredictable time frame. I have to stop the mind control before it ever happens, he thought. There's something else before you go. The woman there, Marinhor said, indicating Madame Spatzel. 
She is nearly ready for her first level. The moment will come when she protects her friends with use of her voice. She will be glad to know that, Kevin replied. But she can't know this as an instruction, Marinhor said. Her levels, like for us all, must come from her intuitive action. She can't go looking for it. She must become one with her skills and talents instinctively. Understood, Kevin replied. What should we do with your chamber after we leave? Keep it secret, Marinhor instructed. But you may return as often as you like. Thank you for your guidance, Marinhor, Kevin said reverently. I will put your wisdom to good use. I know you will, Marinhor answered. Oh, and one more thing. Have a look at that chest in the corner. You should find an emerald ring inside. Kevin's eyes scanned the tomb until he found the chest that Marinhor was speaking of. Inside, there was a golden ring with a great big emerald at the center. Wow, Kevin said. Is this a gift? Marinhor chuckled. More than that, he said. It's a special ring I enchanted before I transported my consciousness into the lamp. Should the time ever come that we need to speak again, simply hold the ring up to the lamp and you will be transported inside with me. Kevin was astonished. Really? How's that even possible? He asked. There is still so much for you to learn, young master. For now, take the lamp and return it to me as you please. I sense that you will need my advice again in the dark times to come. Dark times to come, Kevin asked. That doesn't sound good. Before Marinhor could answer, the red glow faded from the statue's eyes and Kevin picked up the lamp and carefully slipped it into his satchel. Not even an introduction? Madame Spatzel asked with annoyance. He's pretty introverted, Kevin replied, but I learned a lot. Darius, you're not going to like what I've learned about the ancient aliens theories that you hate. I'll fill you in later, but for now I have a phone call to make. Wait, what about ancient aliens? Darius demanded as he followed Kevin to the stairway. They climbed the stairs out of the chamber, replaced the copper hatch, and covered the hole with a rug. Now armed with more information about the symbols that were used in the Eminence film, Kevin called Judy Chen as soon as they got in the car. I want the final cut, Kevin said as soon as Judy answered, not giving her a chance to make one of her snide greetings. It's great to hear your voice too, Kevin, Judy said with her usual sarcasm, but I'm going to deny your request. It's not a request, Kevin said forcefully. I saw the symbols that were inserted into another Eminence film at the London premiere, and you and I both know what they are. It's not happening in our film. Even if Eminence was, in fact, only using mind control to sway audience response to their films, Kevin valued free will above all else. He didn't want anyone forced into liking the film on his behalf. I don't know what you're talking about, Judy replied dismissively. Any symbols in any of our films were purely an artistic choice on behalf of the director. And I assume you want us to give our directors artistic freedom. On her end of the line, she smirked, feeling she now had Kevin in checkmate. Yes, which brings us back to the final cut. Kevin replied, deflating Judy's confidence. The final creative decisions about this film will be made by the people who made it, not the studio. This really isn't up to you, he lectured. It's in the contract that Eminence gets the final cut. Those were the terms of Ashton's contract, Kevin countered. He's off the film, and so is that deal point. Unlike Ashton, I'm not someone you planted here to do your bidding. I'm editing the film myself, and that's the end of the conversation. Emphasizing the point, Kevin hung up before Judy could reply. On the other end of the line in her office, Judy scowled at her phone. She placed it on her desk and pulled out a second cell phone. After dialing, she said, He knows about the symbols and is refusing to turn over the film to our editors. What's our next course of action? As the person on the other end gave their answer, a small smile crossed her lips. Back at the hotel in Cairo, cinematographer Levi Stradling was settling in for a night off of television binging. Thank God they have Vanderpump rules here, he thought, relaxing into his bed. There was a knock on the door. Room service. My cheese fries. That was fast, Levi said happily as he walked to the door. 
but as soon as he opened the door, a thief forced his way inside and held him at knife point. Give me the film canisters, the thief growled. I don't have them, Levi cried. They're right behind you on the table, old man, the thief replied. Now hand them over, I'm not going to ask again. With shaking hands, Levi had no choice but to follow instructions. With the film canisters in hand, the thief crossed the room and let himself out through the sliding doors onto the balcony. He slipped over the railing and jumped. Having just returned from the theater, Kevin Darius and Madame Spatzel were approaching the hotel entrance when the thief dropped down to the ground in front of them. The thief locked eyes with Kevin and took off running in the other direction. Kevin! Levi yelled to him from the balcony. You have to stop that thief! He just took all of the films we've shot here in Egypt. He stole the film! Kevin's newfound ability to speak to the dead enabled him to learn much from ancient pharaoh Merenhor, who told him of the beginnings of levels, and who also explained to him as the current chosen one among all of those who had levels, he must find seven young candidates to be tested to take on the role of the new gatekeeper of the upper realm before Loki dies. Kevin also learned of the mind-controlling hieroglyphics that he realizes in Eminence films. After leaving Marinhor's tomb, Kevin crosses paths with the thief who had just taken roles of the Cleopatra film. With a few seconds head start on Kevin, the thief jumped onto a waiting moped and sped off. Having been directed to the thief who took the film canisters by Levi's yells from his hotel balcony, Kevin jumped back into the car. He normally would have just chased down the thief on foot, but after his lengthy conversation with Marinhor, which utilized his brand new level of communicating with the dead, he was too depleted to use his level 7 speed. The thief looked behind him and was relieved to see the sidewalk clear of pursuers. Thinking he had successfully made his getaway, he slowed the moped, but Kevin quickly screeched alongside him in the car. Hey! Kevin yelled out the window. The thief revved up the moped and swerved down an alley. With the passageway too narrow for the car, Kevin jumped out and stopped a college student riding by on his bike. $10,000 for the bike, Kevin urgently yelled. The rider took his time looking Kevin over. This is a really good bike. $10,000 isn't much of a deal for me. Fine, $100,000, Kevin replied. The rider eyed the sleek Mercedes Kevin had just jumped out of. I'll trade you for the car, the rider said smugly. The rider wasn't about to risk being handed a check by some stranger on the street. Deal, Kevin said, and he tossed him the keys while waiting impatiently for the rider to dismount. The rider sat behind the wheel of the $200,000 car, truly feeling like he had pulled one over on Kevin as Kevin sped down the alley. The thief glanced behind him and saw Kevin closing in on him. Even without the full use of his levels, Kevin could pedal faster than the thief could drive the moped. Finally, Kevin got close enough to leap onto the moped. He yanked the handles to the side, causing the moped to skid and the thief to tumble to the ground. Kevin pinned the thief and demanded, Who put you up to this? Given Atticus Dobble's relentless desire to destroy the Cleopatra Project and Kevin's recent argument with Judy Chen, the head of Eminent Studios, over getting the final cut, it really could have been either of them. I swear I don't know. I was just given an address to send the package to, the thief proclaimed. Kevin's ability to see into the heart of those around him led him to see that the thief was honest about his lack of information. With how quickly the thief folded under the pressure, he clearly didn't have the disposition for a high-level role in an operation like this. Give me the address, Kevin demanded, and as Kevin now expected, the thief willingly handed over his phone. A text message from an unknown contact showed an address in Italy. Kevin quickly Googled it. It was a vineyard in the Italian countryside. The overhead view was blocked by Google satellite imagery. Whoever Atticus was staying with definitely wielded power. They're expecting overnight shipping, the thief said with nerves creeping into his voice. If the package doesn't arrive, they're going to come after me. And a pity that would be, Kevin said sarcastically. I'll make you a deal. I'm going to pay you double whatever you were going to make from this job and you're going to call and say that you want out. The thief, clearly in over his head, dialed the number that sent the text message. Put it on speaker, Kevin instructed. The thief did what he was told. When the call connected, the voice on the other end said, 
You were told to never call this number. There was no mistaking the voice. It was Atticus Davo. Kevin's blood began to boil. Hasn't this guy had enough already? He wondered. He prompted the thief to respond. I wanted to tell you that the deal is off, the thief said, trying to keep his voice from shaking with fear. There was a long pause on the other end. He got to you, didn't he? Um, I don't know what you are talking about, the thief bluffed. I couldn't get into the room you gave me, but now the hotel is suspicious and they have me flagged. I want out. It was a reasonable enough lie. Kevin was almost impressed, but Atticus wasn't so moved. You should know I'm not one to be lied to and clearly I can't trust a word you say. So I'm going to speak directly to you, Kevin Williams. Yes, I know you're listening. The thief's eyes widened while Kevin waited for more. He and Atticus had butted heads enough that it was only ever going to be a matter of time before Atticus got a handle on how Kevin operated. But if Atticus wanted to rattle Kevin, he wasn't going to succeed. You could have just let the canisters go without anyone getting hurt, Kevin, Atticus said condescendingly. But once again, you forced my hand. You have no one but yourself to blame for what comes next. The call dropped and the thief began to panic. He's not going to come after you, Kevin said, rolling his eyes. He just wants you to spend the next year looking over your shoulder. Kevin pulled a wad of cash out of his pocket and handed it over. Maybe this will be a good lesson for you on whom you should be getting into business with in the future. The thief, too shaken to speak, took the money and ran down the alley. Kevin picked up the bag of stolen film canisters and began to walk back toward the hotel. With all of the information Kevin had just gotten from Marinhor in his tomb, he needed to handle more pressing matters, such as seeking the new gatekeeper and restoring the balance of the upper realm. And yet, he was immediately thrown into a chase to retrieve his stolen clean. Pressures were squeezing Kevin from all sides, and he knew he was going to have to turn to one person for help, his friend Brett Stewart of the Myriads. But first, Kevin had to relate what he'd learned from his encounter with the thief. Kevin called President Al-Busari. When the president answered, he said, I'm on the other line with the president of South Africa, but I can always spare a few minutes for the man who saved my daughter's life. I appreciate that, Mr. President, Kevin said, and I think you'll be glad you took the call. Pulling up his Google search, Kevin said, I have an address for where Atticus and Masudi are hiding. They're on a vineyard in Italy. I'll send you the location. That's excellent news, Albasari responded. I'll call the Italian Justice Department and request extradition. You should be warned, though, that process could take weeks or even months. The Italians aren't exactly known for moving with haste. Understood, Kevin replied. I appreciate whatever help you can manage. After he hung up with the president, Kevin prioritized his missions. There was only one scene left to film on the Cleopatra project, and though it was a $500 million project that he was producing and now directing as well, it would have to take a secondary role behind his quest to find the new gatekeeper of the upper realm. Kevin's team worked hard, but it was a weekend and they would not be filming for two days. Kevin could begin his search for the gatekeeper if he and his great ability to delegate and seek help when needed had some of his most loyal allies working on the task as well. Kevin grabbed his phone and dialed Brett Stewart of the Myriads. Brett, of course, answered Kevin's call on the first ring. Kevin, I knew we would speak soon, Brett said before Kevin could even begin to tell him about their grail. We cannot waste any time, Brett, so forgive me if I sound short, Kevin replied. I always trust you to use my time wisely, Kevin. What is it that you need? Brett answered. There's too much to explain right now, but I've learned more about my assignment to find the new gatekeeper for the upper realm. If it fails, the foundation will be prey for the pinnacle's return and all of us may fall under the pinnacle's sway. I cannot allow that to happen to Lily or my unborn twins, Kevin reeled. There are seven candidates to be the new gatekeeper. I must find them and get them to the upper realm for a test. Only one will be chosen. While their talents and skills may not be obvious to those around them now, you and I and others who are of high levels and who understand the role of the upper realm would surely recognize them. I want you to do my legwork and find them. 
and I will then go to explain their role in helping to save the Foundation, Kevin continued. Brett nodded his head on the other side of the phone. What might have sounded like insanity coming from anyone else's mouth made perfect sense when it was spoken by Kevin Williams. And Brett knew that he was being asked to help in a quest that was more important than any other he had ever helped Kevin to carry out. Kevin's words spilled out precisely. He did not want to waste any time. I will ask the headmaster of my school in Washington, D.C., Katja Rafferty, to help with this quest. She is attuned to working with young people and her role can help us when we find possible gatekeepers. Please begin your search immediately. I can leave Egypt in a moment's notice to meet you and Katja. We must find our seven candidates as soon as possible. Brett barely took the time to tell Kevin he understood before he hung up the phone and began his research. There were seven children in the world who had to be found. He knew that Kevin's highly evolved levels and his keen sense of a person's core values would make it easy for him to identify the candidates. Brett only hoped that he would not disappoint his friend and leader by not pinpointing the correct children. Then Brett realized that part of Kevin's greatness was in knowing who was capable of his assignments. Brett began his research in earnest. Back in Cairo, Kevin had the same thought. He knew Brett was the perfect person to find his seven candidates, and until he heard from the Myriad leader and made contact with the first child, he would have to juggle his duties on the Cleopatra project. Now he considered whether he should just go to Italy himself to confront Atticus Stavel, but in comparison to everything else that Kevin was juggling, Atticus seemed like a minor application. He was nothing more than a rival producer who had no levels and whose schemes were strictly about revenge and power. It wasn't as if the fate of the world rested on defeating him. Atticus Stavel would have to wait, Kevin thought. 1,500 miles away, Atticus simmered in rage as he paced around the grand villa of a Tuscan vineyard. Having been thwarted by Kevin yet again, he screamed and threw his phone across the room. He walked outside to where Masudi was relaxing with a book on a lounge chair overlooking the rolling vineyard. We're not getting the canisters, Atticus said with a growl. We need to escalate our tactics. Masudi sighed and took off his sunglasses. Atticus, hasn't this gone on long enough? He asked. I agreed to work with you on this because your father and I go way back with their stupid movies. Now I'm a fugitive. I can possibly never go back to Egypt, and I'm tired. I just want to relax with my book and stop chasing around some annoying American film producer. I suggest that you do the same. This request for revenge is rotting your soul. Did you learn that in your temple, Buddha? Atticus said mockingly. I'm Muslim, Masudi replied with annoyance. Have you really learned nothing during your time in Egypt? Whatever, Atticus yelled. We're so close to doing Kevin Williams in for good, I can feel it. Put down the Merlot and let's go have a chat with our host. We're moving on to plan B. While overseeing the difficult Cleopatra filming, which had experienced yet another bit of sabotage by Kevin's enemy at a Gustavo, Kevin realized his real priority was one even greater than completing a $500 million movie project. He had used his newfound leveled ability to speak with long-dead pharaoh Marinhor, who told him of the hieroglyphics that could be used for mind control. But more important, he had offered more information about Kevin's assignment to find the new gatekeeper of the Upper Realm. Combined with advice from the Night King and information from his vision quest at the birthplace of Velohi, the current gatekeeper, Kevin called in help from Brent Stewart of the Myriads to hurry the search for Elohi's successor. It didn't take Brett long to contact Kevin with information about the first potential candidate for the next Keeper of the White Tower of the Upper Realm. Though Kevin was exhausted from pushing his levels to new heights while in Marinhor's tomb, where he learned he could talk to the dead, and then chasing down the thief hired by Atticus Stavel to steal the Cleopatra film reels, Kevin rallied and was relieved to know that he had not erred in picking Brett Stewart to be his partner in seeking out the Gatekeeper candidates. Check out the video I just sent you, Brett told Kevin. Kevin, getting a rare few moments of rest in his Cairo hotel room, clicked on the attachment that came through as a text message. It opened a link to a video showing a street brawl in the middle of a low-income section of a city somewhere in Sri Lanka. 
An entire mob of thugs was attacking a single person at the center of the sprawling battle. To Kevin's amazement, the defender was actually winning despite being terrifically outnumbered. As Kevin watched, thugs went flying, sometimes singly, sometimes by twos or threes. They crashed into buildings, food carts, and each other. The last thugs were finished off with one flying roundhouse kick from the defender. The thugs went flying, knocking each other over like dominoes. The only person left standing on the street was the defender, which Kevin could now see was a teenage girl. This was exactly the kind of thing Kevin had been looking for. He had gotten the information from the resurrected pharaoh, Marinhor, about how to search for the next keeper of the White Tower of the Upper Realm. Certainly, it seemed like this young girl would have level powers despite her youth. Great work, Kevin told Brett. Catch the next flight to Sri Lanka and I will meet you there. As soon as he hung up with Brett, he made another phone call. The voice that picked up on the other end was cool and professional. You've reached the Williams School. This is the headmistress, Katja Rafferty, speaking. Katja, this is Kevin, Kevin said. Kevin who? Katja said in her best no-nonsense voice. Kevin Williams. My name is on the building that you're sitting in? Kevin explained, thinking it should be obvious. Seriously, it's not like you're the only Kevin in the world, you know, Katja teased. Katja still liked to show a prickly side to Kevin, who had started out as her enemy long ago in the Epic Clash, when her father tried to force her to undermine Kevin so that it was Katja who won the contest and gained entrance to the Upper Realm. But during the competition, Katja had come to see that it was Kevin who earned and deserved his place there. She was now a firm and loyal ally of his. Not that I'm not glad to hear from you, of course. How can I help? Tatcha continued. Teasing could only last for a few seconds with someone as busy and important as Kevin. On the other end of the line, Kevin was also renewing his bond with Katja after having not spoken for some time. Katja always had a brisk, no-nonsense attitude when dealing with everybody from generals to billionaires to small children. But she also had a deep well of warmth and kindness under her gruff exterior. This is why Kevin had appointed her the headmistress of his school, the William School. He knew that she would be able to keep the kids in line while still making them feel loved and accepted. I've got a new mission that I'm working on, Kevin explained to Katja, and it involves children. I immediately thought of you as someone who would be perfect for the job. If you just need a nursemaid, there are better options than me, Katja huffed. But I don't just need a nursemaid, Kevin continued. This is a dangerous mission involving levels in the upper realm. You're also one of the most advanced experts I know. The combination of your fighting skills and your experience with children is what makes you so perfect for this role. Now you're talking, Koch exclaimed. I admit I've been getting a little bit bored playing school teacher. Challenge sounds like just the thing. Katja also competed in the epic clash against Kevin. She was a level seven warrior with highly advanced fighting skills. Although she ultimately lost to Kevin, he won her over to his side as an ally. Where should I meet you? Koch asked. Kevin gave her the flight information and promised to fill her in on all of the details once she arrived before hanging up the phone. Kevin, Brent, and Katja met at the Sri Lankan airport and went directly to the low-income neighborhood where the video Brett had found was shot. The neighborhood was extremely crowded and full of rickety buildings that a strong wind could have toppled, but what Kevin could sense all around him was the energy of industry and entrepreneurship. People smiled and waved at their neighbors, and the unpaved streets were cleaner than some of the ones Kevin had seen in Chicago. So once we find all these kids, Brett began, Kevin then has to take them to the upper realm so they can compete and find out which will be the next keeper of the White Tower. But how are you going to get them there? I thought everybody's journey to the upper realm was different. Let's just stay focused on finding the girl first and convincing her to come with us, Kevin replied. We can worry about the rest of it when we have that problem in front of us. We also have to convince her parents that we're not actually kidnapping their daughter, Kasha added. I've been thinking about that, Kevin nodded. We won't even have to stretch the truth, much. We will tell her parents that we are on a talent scouting mission. Which we kind of are, Brett added. And the Katja here is the headmistress of a school for gifted children in the United States, Kevin continued. Which I am, Katja interjected. So we'll tell the parents that we want to give their children a full scholarship to the school for a special program that includes advanced studies abroad. 
Kevin finished. Welcome. Brett laughed. Just as long as they don't ask how far abroad. Or how advanced, Koch added. And of course we can still bring the children who turn out not to be the next keeper of the White Tower back to the school for their education. Absolutely, Kevin agreed. They reached the small plaza where the video had been shot of the girl beating up a mob of thugs. Kevin walked directly to the nearest tea cellar. The man had a large tea urn strapped to his back with a long spout for pouring, and he had a collection of disposable clay mugs on his belt. Excuse me, Kevin began. Did you happen to witness a fight that took place here several days ago between a large group of thugs and a young girl? I am here to sell tea, the tea seller scoffed. I am not here to answer questions unless you're buying tea. Talking is thirsty work, Kevin agreed. My friends and I will have a round of tea, please. The tea seller poured each of them a cup of tea in a disposable clay mug as soon as Kevin paid, the tea seller told them. Yes, I saw that fight. Do you know who the girl is? Kaja asked. The tea seller only glared at her and waved the spout of his backpack urn. Kevin ordered another round of tea. Yes, I know her, the tea seller replied less than helpfully. Do you know where we can find her? Brett crossed his arms, losing patience with the seller's entrepreneurial spirit. Kevin had already passed over money for the third round of tea. Yes, I know where to find her. Brett and Katja both opened their mouths to ask the next question, but Kevin waved at them to stop. Please don't. We have to be smarter with our questions, or we will all be running for the public toilets before we learn anything of use. He looked at the tea seller. How much to answer all of our questions? All of my tea, the man replied simply. Kevin handed him enough money to pay for a penthouse apartment in the best area of the city for a year. I'll answer any question you ask. The tea seller replied happily. Just as long as we don't have to drink the tea to get the answers, Kevin replied. The tea seller knew the girl and her family well. They lived in one of the buildings directly on the plaza. Her name is Pamela Campari. Her parents are Danka and Shuri. They live on the top floor of that building right there, the tea seller pointed out the building. Kevin thanked the tea seller for his help, but he was already running off to share the good news of his recent windfall with his family. Kevin and the others trekked to the top of the building. They rapped on the first door they saw. It was immediately opened by a disagreeable-looking older woman. She scowled at Kevin in a way that reminded him entirely too much of his mother-in-law, Dorothy. I'm not buying any, she exclaimed. And how dare you come to my door dressed in those rags? She glared at Kevin's simple dockers and cats. Before Kevin could explain that he wasn't selling anything, she slammed the door in his face. They tried knocking on the door. It was only because the three of them had excellent hearing aided by their levels that they heard the weak whisper of, Come in, through the door. Kevin pushed into the studio apartment. There was a man lying on a sleeping mat on the floor. Excuse me, sir, we are looking for the home of Mr. and Mrs. Kambari and their daughter, Pamela. The man coughed a few times, and Kevin could see that his health was very poor. In his private thoughts, Kevin made a reminder for himself to see if there was anything he could do for the man before they left the neighborhood. I am Shuri Kampari, the man wheezed. Pamela is my daughter. We are from a school from gifted children in the United States, Katja explained. We'd like to talk to you and your daughter about a possible scholarship opportunity. Instead of smiling, the man burst into tears. I am afraid this good luck has come to my daughter too late. Why? Kevin asked, alarmed. Because my brilliant, talented daughter Pamela has disappeared. Kevin recruited Katja Rafferty, the headmistress of the Williams Academy, and Brent Stewart of the Myriads to accompany him on his mission to locate the first potential candidate to be the new gatekeeper of the Upper Realm, a teenage girl named Pamela Campari who lived in a low-income neighborhood of a village in Sri Lanka. However, when they finally located Pamela's ailing father, Srihi, they were alarmed to learn that the girl had disappeared. Kevin helped Srihi sit upright on his sleeping mat while Brett made tea, and Katja went out for food and supplies to help the sick man. What do you mean your daughter Pamela has disappeared? Kevin asked. She said she was going to look into becoming a teacher at the local martial arts school. My Pamela has always been an extremely talented fighter, far beyond what should be possible for a child of her age. 
Shrihi explained. Yes, that is what brought us here, Kevin replied. We saw a video of her fighting off an entire mob of thugs. She made it look easy. After that video came out, she received an invitation from one of the best martial arts schools in the area to come to discuss a possible job, Shrihi continued. As you can see, our family is very poor. My wife took a job working in an offshore refinery, but after I became ill, even that wasn't enough to support us. We wanted Pamela to stay in school, but she insisted on going when this job offer came in. And you're sure the job at the martial arts school is for a teacher? Brett asked as he brought tea over. What else could it be for? Shrihi wondered. Kevin and Brett traded looks. There was any number of unscrupulous people who would want to try and take advantage of a child like Pamela, particular since she was such a powerful fighter. Kevin decided not to worry Shrihi with his concerns while the man was so weak and sick. Kevin directed the conversation back to Shrihi's earlier comment. But at first, you said your daughter had disappeared. Now you're telling us she's just at a job interview? She left three days ago, Shrihi explained. I haven't heard a word from her since, and I am too weak to leave the apartment to go look for her. We'll be happy to go look for your daughter for you, sir, Kevin told the worried father. I'm about to be a father myself, and if for some reason I couldn't go looking for my own missing child, I would hope that someone would be able to do it in my place. Thank you, exclaimed Shrihi. I can tell you how worried I've been. The invitation is there on the table. Shrihi pointed it out, and Brett brought the invitation to Kevin. It was a large card used to promote the martial arts school. Scrawled across the back was a handwritten note in an unsteady hand inviting Pamela to come there at a certain time and on a certain day to learn more about a prospective job. There were deep scratches in the card around the edges. What could have caused those scratches? Brett wondered aloud. Kevin got a sinking feeling. I think I know who is trying to recruit our first candidate for the next guardian of the White Tower of the Upper Realm, he told Brett. It's Vincent Reeves. Indeed, Kevin was correct. Just then, Vincent was running Pamela through her third day of tests. He had an armored vehicle driven directly into the martial arts school training room. The room itself was the size of an aircraft hangar. Inside the vehicle were several trained mercenaries armed with paintball guns. If Pamela could disable the vehicle and take out all of the men inside without taking a single hit from the paintball guns, Vincent had promised her a job that would make her richer beyond her wildest dreams and enable her to take care of her parents for the rest of their lives. Pamela had accomplished the task in record time, dodging bullets as if they were moving in slow motion, slipping under the armored vehicle to take out the fuel lines, and then using the vehicle's spare tire to break a window and disarm the men inside. When she had finished, Vincent clapped enthusiastically. Or rather, he knocked his two prosthetic hooks together. Unfortunately, they only made an unsatisfying clink-clink-clink noise. Once again, Vincent cursed Kevin Williams for cutting off not one, but both of his hands. Pamela planted her hands on her hips and surveyed the damage that she had just done. The armored vehicle would need a ton of repairs before it was of any use again. The mercenaries were scattered about the room in various states of consciousness. Although Pamela was anxious to get this job and be able to take care of her parents, she had still been careful not to do any permanent damage to any of the mercenaries. Is that enough now? Pamela demanded of Vincent. Have I proven that I am worthy of whatever this job you're offering is? Well, Vincent scratched his chin carefully with one of his hooks. I have been wondering how you would do if faced with an aerial assault. But I've already been here for three days, Pamela protested. I need to go home and check on my father. He's been sick, and I shouldn't have left him alone this long. I already sent word to him about where you are and how long you would be, Vincent lied to the girl. I'll be happy to send a trained nurse to make sure he's okay. My family can't afford in-home nursing, Pamela protested. We can consider it an advance on your first paycheck, Vincent assured her. Pamela's face lit up. Does that mean that I got the job? You sure did, Vincent replied. I was really just kidding about that whole aerial assault thing. 
He turned to his assistant, who was actually a secluded Valley assassin, and muttered so that only the assassin could hear. Cancel the helicopter attack for now, okay? The assassin nodded and went to make the call. Vincent could tell that Pamela was getting antsy. He didn't want to risk pushing the girl too far and having her decide to go home. In truth, he wasn't sure if he could stop her if she decided to leave. The girl was simply too powerful. So when do I find out more about this job? Pamela wanted to know. Right now. Vincent waved her over to a table where a contract that was three inches thick sat on the table. Everything you need to know about the job is laid out in this contract. Just sign here on the dotted line. Shouldn't I read this contract first? Pamela asked. Or maybe I should have my dad look at it. Vincent pasted on a smile that was supposed to be warm, but actually it showed too many teeth. Of course, you should take all the time you need. Pamela reached for the contract, but Vincent slammed one of his hooks down on top of it, stopping her. The hook shredded the edge of the page. Vincent had found out that hooks were very useful for a lot of activities, but they were generally a detriment to anything involving paperwork. But they also played a heck of a game with his penmanship. Of course, Vincent continued. I won't be able to send that nurse to your father until the contract is actually signed. And the longer that you take to sign it, the longer your father's recovery will be delayed. I hope he is not too ill, or the delay could cause him permanent damage or even, you know, death. Pamela's heart sank at the thought of her beloved father languishing in their tiny apartment for even a moment longer than necessary. I guess you're right. It would be better to get my dad some care first and then work out the details of the job. Pamela picked up the pen. Stop right there, a voice ordered. Vincent and Pamela turned to see three people stride into the martial arts school. Vincent recognized the man in the lead immediately. Kevin Williams, Vincent snarled. You're too late. No, I'm not, Kevin retorted. Pamela, I know you don't know me, but don't sign anything with this man before you have a chance to hear what we have to say. He is not your only option to help your parents. Don't listen to this liar, Vincent ordered Pamela. He'll try to tell you he's a freedom-loving eco-warrior billionaire who wants to help you and save the world, but don't be fooled. I mean, just look at how he's dressed. Pamela considered Kevin's modest dockers and kids. Pretty lame for a billionaire, she agreed. Kevin shook his head and looked at his companions. Everybody is a fashion critic. Brett and Katya just shrugged. They disagree with Pamela, but it wasn't the time for them to add their opinions into the mix. When Kevin looked back, Vincent and Pamela had disappeared. Where did they go? Kevin demanded. Vincent's assistant stepped from a concealed door in the wall. I wouldn't worry about that right now if I were you, he told Kevin. If I were you, I'd be worried about us. The assistant snapped his fingers. Door slammed open all over the school and hundreds of secluded Valley assassins flooded the large training room. Kevin Katja and Brett tended to the ailing Shrihi who related that his daughter Pamela went for a scholarship interview at a martial arts school three days ago. Kevin realized this was a trick, and indeed, Vincent Reeves got to Pamela first and was about to trick her into signing a contract with him. Kevin intervened only to have Vincent flee Pamela and unleash hundreds of secluded Valley assassins on Kevin and his friends. Kevin, Kutcha, and Brett drew together, back to back, as the secluded Valley assassins piled into the hangar-sized training room of the best martial arts school in Pamela's Sri Lankan hometown. There were hundreds of them, all leveled fighters trained to be the deadliest assassins in the world. But Brett was a level 5 fighter in his own right. Katja had progressed all the way to level 7 and was almost as powerful as Kevin himself. It was she who had been his greatest challenge when the two battled in the epic clash. Kevin won and Katja eventually realized he deserved the victory, and had pushed her levels to an even higher stage than when they had begun when she embarked on that contest. Of course, Kevin was still the most skilled and highly loved fighter of them all. However, they were overwhelmingly outnumbered. Hundreds of glints of light flicked through the room as the secluded valley assassins pulled knives and threw stars from their belts in one smooth choreographed motion. Blades! Kevin yelled to warn his companions as the assassins all flung their weapons at Kevin at once. 
Kevin drew his night dagger and caught plucked the first two knives from the air to use them to deflect the rest of the blades. Kevin and Katja spun in circles at great speed too quickly for the human eye to follow. Some of the deflected knives and throwing stars clattered harmlessly to the floor or stuck in the walls or ceiling. Others were returned to their owner, sharpened point first and at great velocity. Many of the secluded valley assassins went down without a sound. Meanwhile, Brent bent low and dove into a nearby training sphere. The round metal cage was meant to be used both as a training apparatus and as a piece of exercise equipment akin to a hamster ball. Brett intended to use it for those exact dual purposes, as a shield and an offensive weapon. Blades pinged off of the metal cage as Brett secured himself inside and got the heavy sphere rolling. Knowing that as a moving target, it would be next to impossible for anyone to throw a blade through the narrow bars. The lead assassin made a silent hand gesture to his subordinates. The hundreds of remaining fighters drew wickedly sharp swords from their belts. Kevin could feel Katja gathering her leveled powers beside him. He put a hand on her arm. No point in us both exhausting our powers. I'll go first and you can be our backup. Katja didn't like it, but she recognized that Kevin had progressed beyond where her own powers were. They needed to get after Pamela as soon as possible, and Kevin was more likely to end the battle quickly than she was. I'll guard your back, Katja agreed. She scooped up a sparring stick from a nearby rack and ran to meet the first wave of assassins that were approaching Kevin's rear. She disarmed the first two with their swords sliced through her sparring stick, leaving her with nothing but kindling. Katja scooped up their swords and fought two-handed against the next wave of armed assassins. Kevin turned on the rest of the attackers. They were spread out over a large area, too smart to make themselves an easy target by bunching up. Kevin would have to be very precise about his use of his levels to end this battle quickly. The Night King had told him long ago that he had to reserve his skills for the most dangerous moments. There was, at present, a finite amount of powers at Kevin's fingertips, and to exhaust them needlessly could render him in the end powerless. But Kevin knew that this was not a time to use his skills and his levels sparingly. Kevin gathered his powers, channeling the energy up through his core, down through his arms, into his fingertips. Kevin flung his hands out at the closest group of assassins. Five tiny bolts of blue light flew from his fingertips, each one finding its target in an assassin's mouth or eyes. The assassins went down screaming, eyes bleeding or throats filling up with blood. Again and again, Kevin flung out his power in tiny bolts, each one taking out another highly trained assassin. They went down in waves, curled up and writhing on the ground, clutching their faces and screaming in pain. Katja yelled over the noise of the battle, Go after Pamela. Don't let Vincent get away. Kevin glanced around. The number of secluded valley assassins had been greatly reduced thanks to his and Katja's combined powers. Brett was still rolling the metal cage around the huge training facility, taking out assassins in twos and threes like a bowling ball taking down pins. His friends had the situation well in hand and Pamela needed to be their priority. Without another word, Kevin ducked through the hidden door that Vincent and Pamela had exited through earlier. Kevin found himself standing on the street. He realized he was back in the low-income neighborhood not far from where Pamela and her father lived. The battle had only taken moments and he could see Vincent and Pamela a few blocks ahead. Vincent had Pamela by the arm and was pulling her along as quickly as possible. Ow! Pamela squealed. Dude, watch it with the hook. You don't have to do that. I want to come with you. Vincent! Kevin yelled down the street as he raced after them. I'm not done with you. Vincent turned around to stare at Kevin. Don't come any closer, Vincent commanded. He opened the door of a nearby green stretch Hummer and shoved Pamela inside, ignoring her protests. He slammed the door, cutting off her words in mid-sentence. First, you soup to endangering innocent pets. Kevin sneered, referring to their last meeting at a dog park in Chicago. Now you've stooped to kidnapping children. Is there nothing you won't resort to in order to try and bring down the foundation, Vincent? Nothing, Vincent yelled. You'll find out how far I'm willing to go if you come one step closer. He pointed to a rickety-looking building. Like many in this low-income neighborhood, it wouldn't take much to send it toppling into rubble. What are you going to do? Kevin demanded. 
You can't bring down entire buildings on a whim anymore, Vincent. You don't have your levels. You haven't had them since I took them away from you during our battle for control of the Water Guardian in Lake Erie. Vincent laughed and it sent a chill down Kevin's spine. You're wrong about that, Kevin Williams. You couldn't be more wrong. You and your Night Dagger took my hand then, but you did not take my powers from me. Forever. Kevin knew what Vincent sounded like when he was bluffing. He had heard Vincent do it enough times before. This was definitely not a bluff. But how could that be possible? Kevin reached out with his senses toward Vincent. Just as Vincent had promised, Kevin could sense that he had somehow reacquired all seven of his previous levels. Kevin's eyes went wide with amazement. How did you do that? How did you get your levels back again? Hard work, dedication, and perseverance, Vincent told Kevin. Kevin rolled his eyes. Now I know you're lying about that. This must be some kind of trick. No trick. The doorway of the damned can do things you aren't even able to dream of in your boring do-gooder dreams, Vincent crowed. Vincent had used the doorway of the damned to enter the lower realm, where Kevin had encountered him before. You still don't believe me? Then perhaps a little demonstration is in order, Vincent sneered. Actually, it was as far as Kevin got before Vincent flung his arms wide at the building and sent a powerful wave of leveled energy crashing into its foundation. Immediately, the building began to topple, heading right for Kevin. Kevin turned his attention away from Vincent. He could hear screams of terror from the people inside the building. Kevin gathered all of his energy and sent it out in a powerful pulse at the building, desperately trying to restabilize it. However, Kevin's leveled powers were strained from his use of them just moments ago on the secluded Valley Assassins. Furthermore, Vincent's blast had done too much damage to the crumbling building. It was disintegrating as Kevin watched. Suddenly, Katja and Brett were beside him. Katja and Brett lent Kevin their strength by joining their powers with his. The building settled back on its foundation with only a few pieces tumbling from its roof and walls. The residents poured out of the front door and into safety. Drained from his levels, Kevin collapsed to the ground once the final resident had exited the building. What happened to Pamela and Vincent? Brett asked. Kevin shook his head. Vincent took Pamela, and they got away. Kevin, Brett, and Katja traveled to Sri Lanka to meet a talented young fighter named Pamela in hopes that she might be worthy of becoming the next gatekeeper of the Upper Realm. But once they arrived, Kevin and his team discovered that Vincent Reeves had already sunk in his metal claws deep into the fighting prodigy. Before Kevin would turn the young fighter back to the side of good, Vincent unleashed a squadron of secluded valley assassins. Kevin, Brad, and Katja were able to fight off the leveled assassins, but Vincent took Pamela and escaped during the skirmish. The dust settled in the aftermath of the fierce battle with the secluded valley assassins. Kevin, Brett, and Katja caught their breath, surveying the scene of mayhem left behind. Amid the chaos, Kevin couldn't shake a troubling observation. Vincent Reeves had seemingly regained his level 7 abilities. He had his levels back, Kevin noted. Vincent Reeves, all of them. Are you sure? Brett probed. How is that possible? Katja inquired. Kevin could sense the subtle energy emanating from Vincent before the melee, a familiar aura that bespoke the regained abilities. I'm not sure, Kevin responded, but it's a question that needs to be answered, eventually. The realization gnawed at Kevin's curiosity. Vincent, having previously lost his leveled abilities, had somehow managed to reclaim them. Intrigued, Kevin considered the possibilities. Had Vincent struck a nefarious deal with some unknown evil force? Had Vincent stumbled upon a yet unseen source of power that rejuvenated his skills? Vincent had said almost outright that going through the doorway of the dam to the lower realm had rendered him a level 7 again. But could that be true? The mystery loomed, casting an even darker shadow over the quest to find the next gatekeeper of the upper realm. We shouldn't stay here, Brett noted. The authorities will be here soon. We have to find Pamela, Kevin counted. If I could just talk to her. She left with Vincent Reeves, Katja offered. Didn't put up much of a fight either. Didn't put up any fight, Brett pushed back. She chose him. She chose Vincent Reeves. Maybe she's not the potential gatekeeper we thought she could be. She's young, Kevin replied, and we don't know enough about her or her situation. 
but I think it's time we find out. Brett and Katja nodded in agreement. The trio retraced their steps back to the modest dwelling of Pamela's father, Shrihi, a dingy apartment complex in the middle of town, a somber living space for Pamela and Shrihi, and now it seemed even more unhappy in the aftermath of the recent battle. As Kevin approached, he could see the weariness etched on Shrihi's face, lines of hardship that told a long tale of suffering. Shrihi welcomed Kevin, a glimmer of hope flickering in his tired eyes. You've returned, Shrihi exclaimed, his voice weak but his spirit strong. Were you able to find my Pamela? Shrihi, Kevin replied gently, doing his best to deliver the bad news with kindness. We found Pamela, but she didn't want to come with us. She's working for a man named Vincent Reeves, an evil man we've dealt with in the past. I'm sorry, but we couldn't bring her home. Shrihi's spirit suddenly matched his weakened frame, his shoulders sank. I see. The tired old man replied, That's all right. It was my fault for hoping for something different. My fault for hoping at all. Kevin turned to Brett and Katja. This poor man. Will you tell us about her? Katja asked with compassion. Of course, Shrihi replied. I don't have much to offer you, but come in and I'll brew you all some coffee. Later, as the quartet sipped tasty Sri Lankan coffee, Shrihi bared the harsh realities of his family's existence. It's been hard, Shrihi explained. Pamela dropped out of school at a young age, a sacrifice she made to take care of me when my health started to fail. Shrihi painted a poignant picture of their struggles. The weight of financial woes pressed down on them as their last rupees dwindled. Pamela was always an extraordinarily talented girl, her father continued. Seated in the dimly lit room, Kevin delicately broached the subject of Pamela's past. He sought to unravel the enigma of her life, aiming to understand the origins of her extraordinary abilities. Did you train her? Kevin pressed, curious. From the videos we watch, she seems to be quite the fighter. Me? Shrihi replied. Heavens no. I've never fought a day in my life. Pamela was just always naturally gifted. So much skill and so quick to pick up on new techniques. It was amazing to watch her grow so fast. I honestly don't know where she gets it from. Kevin took note of the reply. It seemed that Pamela was, in fact, the prodigy. A good sign. Her father continued. But that was a problem. As my health got worse and our money dried up, my poor Pamela became a target for those who saw her fighting talents and knew her family's dire situation. Vultures. All of them. All wanting a piece of my poor daughter's talents, but not to help her for their own evil purposes. Shrihi practically spat out the words that left such a bitter taste in his mouth. His beloved daughter was nothing but a pawn to others who wanted to use her for her prodigious skills. Shrihi's health had reached a precarious state, and the burden on Pamela's young shoulders had become overwhelming. The desperate circumstances left them vulnerable, and the shadows of morally bankrupt opportunists lurked. Listening to Shrihi's plight, Kevin felt a renewed sense of determination. The quest to find the next gatekeeper had transcended mere recruitment. It had become a mission to uplift those burdened by unfair hardship. With a steely resolve, Kevin pledged not only to safeguard Pamela from those who sought to exploit her, but also to provide a lifeline for Shrihi in his time of need. Shrihi, Kevin offered, I promise you will find your daughter and make sure she isn't preyed upon by evil forces ever again. No, that's all right, Shrihi countered. You don't owe me anything, and I don't owe you anything. The skepticism in Shrihi's eyes betrayed a history of disappointments and betrayals, a narrative etched in the weariness of the sick man's face. Kevin sensed the reluctance and understood the trust needed to be earned, not merely requested. Undeterred, Kevin shifted his approach. I can only imagine a small portion of what you're going through. Kevin offered. I've been broke before and I know the extra weight that puts on your shoulders, especially when you have a family to take care of. Aware the tree he had weathered countless attempts to exploit Pamela for financial gain, Kevin chose to reveal a personal aspect of his own life. With sincerity, he shared the news of impending fatherhood, inviting Shrihi into a realm of shared human experience. The truth is, I'm going to be a father too, Kevin explained. Shrihi's defensive eyes lit up for a moment. How wonderful, boy or girl? Kevin smiled. 
Both? Twins! Shrihi exclaimed. That's good luck! Kevin shook his head in agreement. I hope you're right. And as one soon-to-be father to another father, let me help you. Let us help you. I know it's hard to trust anyone, but we only have your daughter's best interest at heart. The shadow of suspicion lingered in Shrihi's eyes. The scars of past betrayals ran deep, making it difficult for him to embrace fully the goodwill offered by Kevin. Realizing that action spoke louder than words, Kevin silently resolved to demonstrate his commitment to helping Shrihi and Pamela. I know you've been preyed upon in the past, Kevin continued, but let me show you that we're only here to help. What if I wrote you a check a million dollars? No, Shrihi pushed back. That's an amazing offer, but money isn't everything, and Pamela and I have bigger problems. Then what? Kevin replied. What can I do to help? Name it. Anything. Shrihi's eyes swelled with worry. My wife, he explained. Pamela's mother. When I got too sick to provide, Pamela's mother made the sacrifice to leave for a distant work facility. It was only supposed to be for a few months, till I got back on my feet... But that was almost two years ago now. She still sends money back, but we've had no other contact or information about her well-being. No news of when she'll return or even where she is. I fear that she'll never return, that they won't let her. I need my wife back. Pamela needs her mother. Please, if you mean what you say, don't worry about me. Save her. Kevin understood the gravity of the situation. He empathized with Shrihi's plight. With a resolute expression, Kevin responded, I will do everything in my power to bring your wife back and ease the financial challenges you face. You have my word, Shrihi. Shrihi's eyes softened for a fleeting moment, a glimmer of hope sparked by Kevin's promise. The burdens that had weighed on him seemed momentarily lifted as the prospect of a better future hovered on the horizon. I want to believe you, Kevin Williams, Shrihi affirmed, his words carrying the hopes of a father desperate to see his family reunited. Kevin put a reaffirming hand on the sick man's shoulder. I'll bring your wife back, and then I'll save your daughter. You're a good man and father, and your family deserves to be happy. Shrihi smiled meekly. He wanted to believe Kevin. He wanted to see his family again. In that moment, Kevin realized his journey was only just beginning. He had to find the next gatekeeper of the Upper Realm, but first they had to make things right for a small, poor family in need. After battling with the secluded Valley Assassins, Kevin watched as Vincent Reeves escaped with the young fighting prodigy Pamela. Desperate to get more information about the young fighter, Kevin, Brett, and Kacha visited Pamela's ailing father, Shrihi. Shrihi explained his family's hardships and revealed that his wife had been taken to a work facility, never to be seen again. Kevin promised to bring Shrihi's wife back. In the modest surroundings of Shrihi's home, Kevin, Brett, and Kacha did their best to gather any information that could lead to the return of Pamela's mother. So you don't know where she is? Kacha asked. No, when she signed up, they took her on a boat, Shrihi replied. But we haven't been able to talk to her since, not by phone or letter. You said your wife still sends you and Pamela money, Kevin inquired. Yes, Shrihi replied. A small sum every three months or so. Kevin and Brett shared a look. This was their way in. How does your wife send the money? Brett probed, recognizing that the smallest bit of information could unlock the greatest mystery. Shrihi, thoughtful, responded. Money orders. It's the lifeline that keeps us going. Here, I have one here. Kevin's focus sharpened as Shrihi produced the latest money order, a tangible link to the whereabouts of Pamela's mother. The slip of paper became a map tracing the steps of a woman determined to support her family from a terribly great distance. Examining the money order, Kevin sought clues that could guide him to Pamela's mother. The details on the document, seemingly mundane, held the potential to reveal a path leading to the factory where Shrihi's wife was surely being held captive as a veritable slave. With a steely resolve, Kevin declared, First National Bank. What about it? Katya replied. This money order didn't list the location that it came from, Kevin explained, but it was processed through First National Bank. They'll have to know where the facility is where Pamela's mother is being held. 
Where did she send this money order from? So what will you do? Shrihi asked. We'll follow this trail and see where it leads, Kevin offered. We'll find your wife and bring her home. With the money order in hand, Kevin was off and running. This was the clue they needed. Without hesitation, Kevin dialed the number for the First National Bank of Sri Lanka, his patience tested by the monotonous hum of the dial tone. After what felt like an eternity, a brusque voice answered on the other end. First National Bank, how may I help you? The bank representative's tone carried an air of detachment as if she were accustomed to handling countless routine matters a day. Kevin responded with urgency. Hello? I'm calling regarding a money order issued from your bank last month for 8,300 rupees. I need information about the account holder. The bank representative chuckled, dismissing Kevin's request. Sir, I'm afraid we don't provide personal information on our accounts, especially for such negligible sums. If you have any concerns, I suggest you contact the account holder directly. Determined to press forward, Kevin explained. I understand your reluctance, but this is an important matter regarding a missing person. Can you please check with your manager and see if you can provide any assistance? A condescending reply followed. Like it. Sir, we deal with thousands and thousands of transactions daily. We can't waste time on every inquiry we receive about a money order for such a minuscule amount. If you have no other business with the bank, I'll have to end this call. Undeterred, Kevin pleaded. This isn't a waste of time. Lives are at stake here. Please, is there someone else I can speak to? Someone who might be able to help? This is Kevin Williams. I have $9 billion in holdings with your bank. The bank representative seemed distracted. Uh, I'm sorry. I have to put in my lunch order before it's too late. Have a good day. With that, the line went dead. They hung up on me, Kevin offered, dumbfounded. Frustration crept over Kevin as he realized the indifference he faced. So what do we do now? Brett asked. They don't want to talk to us on the phone, Kevin replied, so I guess we'll have to go pay them a visit. Undeterred by the dismissive laughter echoing in his memory from the previous phone call, Kevin, Brett, and Katya headed to the First National Bank of Sri Lanka, determined to overcome the bureaucratic obstacles that stood between Kevin and... As Kevin entered the bank, he approached the customer service desk, where a clerk with an air of privilege glanced up from behind the counter. Can I help you? The clerk's annoyed tone suggested an expectation that Kevin's business would be a waste of time. Kevin spoke with a polite but firm demeanor. Yes, I need to speak with the bank manager regarding a matter of great importance. It's about a money order issued from this bank. The clerk eyed Kevin's simple attire, his dockers and keds, and then shook his head disagreeably. I'm sorry, sir, but you'll have to schedule an appointment. Bank managers are usually quite busy with real customers, the clerk replied, barely concealing his disdain. Kevin attempted to convey the urgency of the situation. I am a real customer, and this is a matter that requires immediate attention. I believe this money order could help us solve a dire mystery. The clerk, unmoved by Kevin's plea, responded curtly. Sir, we have protocols. Please schedule an appointment, or if you're just looking to beg for money, please go outside. There's nothing more I can do. Beg for money? Kevin replied. I have an account with this bank. If you just look up my name, you'd see. The clerk frowned. Here, take a rupee. Good day. The clerk handed Kevin a rupee and turned away. Feeling the weight of bureaucratic indifference once again, Kevin left the bank determined to find an alternate solution. How rude, Brett suggested. If you want them to take you seriously, Kevin, Katja offered, you need to start dressing the part. I like my kids. They suit me, Kevin replied. I know you do, Katja countered playfully, but let me see if I can do better. Recognizing the need to adapt to the local customs and expectations, Katja, with an amused glint in her eyes, led Kevin to a bustling street market. Stalls adorned with colorful fabrics and intricate garments stretched along the crowded lanes. Let's get you something a bit more flashy, Katja said with a mischievous smile as she browsed through the vibrant array of clothing. Kevin shrugged. I hate flashy. After a brief exploration of the market, Katja guided Kevin to a vendor specializing in elegant attire. The vendor, an elderly man with a keen eye for style, greeted them warmly. Ah, sir, allow me to offer you something truly exquisite, the vendor suggested, eyeing Kevin's simple dockers and kid shoes. Katja, the seasoned negotiator, engaged in a spirited haggle with the vendor, ensuring they secured not just any outfit, but one that would lend Kevin an air of sophistication befitting his quest. 
Soon, Kevin found himself in a fitting room, shedding his nondescript attire for a garment that mirrored the rich culture of Sri Lanka, while also presenting the air of a modern businessman. He emerged in a finely tailored black velvet suit adorned with glittering metallic threads and flourishes. The fabric hugged his form with an air of refinement. Katja couldn't help but admire her handiwork. Well, Kevin, you look positively dashing. Let's get back to the bank and see how helpful they are now. Dressed in his newfound elegance, Kevin confidently approached the bank clerk. I'm here about this money order. I want to know where it came from. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. The clerk, now highly attentive, was eager to help, unlike Kevin's last encounter with him. And let my co-workers get you a latte and a fresh newspaper. Kevin shot Katja a look as the bank worker scrambled to make him comfortable. Nice work, Kevin's eyes said. A few minutes later, the clerk returned with the information. The money order you inquired about originates from a remote island off the northern coast. Kevin leaned forward, pressing for more details. Can you give me the name of the island? The bank clerk hesitated, choosing his words carefully. It's not a place that likes nosy inquiries, but these are the coordinates they deliver their physical money orders from. The clerk wrote down some numbers and handed them to Kevin. Kevin thanked the bank worker and headed for the exit. The mention of a remote island shrouded in secrecy piqued his curiosity. Pamela's mother has to be working on this island, Kevin explained. So what are we waiting for? Brent offered with a winning smile. Kevin, Brett, and Katja headed off and quickly hired a private helicopter. Kevin would have preferred to fly coach, but the secluded nature of the island made a private helicopter their only option. Kevin decided he would pilot the craft himself. I'll fly us to the island, Kevin noted. Strap in and let's go. The helicopter carrying Kevin, Brett, and Katja soared through the sky. A mysterious facility on a remote island, Brett repeated. Sounds ominous. What do you think we're flying into? I'm not sure, Kevin replied, but let's be ready for anything. There it is. Katja called out, pointing to a barren-looking island in the distance. I'm going to land us on the shore, Kevin noted. We need to make sure they know we're friendly, in case. The flight was abruptly interrupted by a thunderous explosion. A missile launched from the island had found its mark, sending the helicopter into a chaotic descent. The trio inside braced for impact as the helicopter spiraled toward the unknown depths below. Kevin tried to regain control, but it was too late. The helicopter was going to crash. Looking to learn more about a young fighting prodigy named Pamela, Kevin and his team, including Brett Stewart and Katja Rafferty, visited the young girl's father in the slums of Sri Lanka. Srihi, the girl's ailing father, described his family's many hardships, including the fact that his wife had been taken to a work facility never to be seen again. Kevin followed a bank paper trail and located the island, which he flew to with his team by helicopter. But as they approached, they were hit by a missile, which plummeted them toward an almost certain death. As the helicopter nosedived toward the ground, Kevin called out to Brett and Katja. The controls are dead. Brace. Brace for impact. We're going down. Brett and Katja strapped themselves in as the helicopter spiraled out of control. The wreckage of the helicopter lay scattered along the rocky shore of the remote island. Amid the twisted metal and billowing smoke emerged Kevin, Katja, and Brett, alive and defiant. Is everyone okay? Kevin quickly checked. I've been better, Brett joked, but still here, for now. Kevin swiftly rummaged through a satchel, extracting potent healing concoctions. Katja and Brett, still recovering from the aftermath of the helicopter crash, willingly accepted the herbal remedies that promised swift recovery. The miraculous effects of Kevin's medicines began to take hold, mending wounds and invigorating the weary fighters. Better, Katja offered. That feels better. As the trio regained their strength, Kevin surveyed the surroundings, his eyes narrowing at a looming compound in the distance. The concrete structure exuded an air of dread, and Kevin's instincts told him that the answers to the island's mysteries lay within its confines. Kevin, ever the tactician, assessed the situation. Katja, Brett, we need to play possum, Kevin whispered, his gaze now fixed on the approaching security team. Act like you're more injured than you are. 
We need to get closer to that compound without arousing suspicion. Faking injury and weakness could be our ticket to get inside. Katja and Brett, adept at the art of deception, nodded in silent understanding. With Kevin taking the lead, they staggered and swayed, simulating greater injuries than really dictated. The security team believed they had successfully subdued the trio with their rocket blast. Katja clutched her side, feigning pain, while Brett, with a skillful touch of theatricality, stumbled with every step. Kevin, playing his part with equal finesse, struggled to stay on his feet, creating an illusion of vulnerability. The security team, clad in tactical gear and armed to the teeth, approached with force. Survivors, secure them, barked the committing officer, rallying his team into action. The trio was swiftly surrounded. The security team, their guard seemingly lowered, fell for the ruse. With a sense of urgency, they transported the supposed injured survivors toward the concrete compound. Kevin, Katja, and Brett were dragged with their faked frailty toward the facility. As they neared the entrance, Kevin's mind raced with possibilities. What awaited them within those walls? Why were they shot down? What exactly was this place? The thick metal doors to the facility creaked open, revealing a maze of interchangeable corridors and chambers. Kevin took in the sights. The next chapter of the journey had just begun. Inside the concrete compound, Kevin, Katja, and Brett were quickly imprisoned as infiltrators in a damp, dark holding cell. There were no windows and very little light. The cell was a cold, cramped enclosure, its walls thick stone. Kevin, Katja, and Brett found themselves confined, prisoners of an enemy whose motives remained shrouded in mystery. What do we think? Brett asked. Nothing good, Katja replied. We're still just gathering information, Kevin countered. When we know exactly what's going on here, we'll strike back. Footsteps could suddenly be heard echoing through the narrow corridor outside the cell. Someone's coming, Brett noted. Be ready for anything, Kevin replied. The air grew tense, and the trio braced themselves. The cell door swung open, revealing a tiny figure cloaked in darkness. Hello there, my new friends, the figure mocked. Allow me to introduce myself. I am the boss. The boss, a small but sinister presence with an air of malevolence, stepped into the light, flanked by two dozen muscular guards. Kevin scanned the group quickly, no levels to be found in any of them. The boss focused on Kevin, the apparent leader of the infiltrators, and he wasted no time in posing questions meant to unravel the purpose behind their intrusion. Why are you here? How did you find us? The boss interrogated, his voice laced with hostility. Kevin, maintaining his composure, met the boss's piercing gaze. Our navigation equipment failed and we accidentally flew off course, Kevin lied. The crash was unfortunate, but we mean no harm. Something hit us in the air. The boss, unmoved by Kevin's words, made it clear that their fate was sealed. You won't be able to talk your way out of this. That something was a missile. You were flying over forbidden ground. All trespassers must be punished. I hereby order you to work for us until a time that your abilities are deemed useless. If you're lucky, we can use you. If not, this could be your final night alive. The boss grinned with seething evil pleasure as the guards surrounded the trio. Kevin, Brett, and Katja were bound by thick metal chains around their feet. The boss satisfied it to the main barracks. Chained and led through the gray concrete corridors of the compound, Kevin, Katja, and Brett found themselves in the heart of the structure, which revealed itself to be some kind of metal refining factory. The air hummed with the rhythmic pulse of machinery, and the scent of molten metal permeated the atmosphere. It's a metal refinery, Kevin whispered. But what kind of metal? Brett inquired. And for what purpose? Katja added. As the group continued forward through a long corridor, they could see the refinery through thick glass windows. Kevin took note of workers dressed in bulky radiation suits working with the metal. Radiation suits? Kevin muttered curiously to himself. The metal they're refining must be radioactive in some way. That's incredibly dangerous. The boss, a tiny figure with a grandiose air of authority, guided the trio through the intricate workings of the factory. 
Rows of towering machines adorned with pipes and valves could be seen. The unmistakable glow of molten metal cast an ethereal light on the surroundings. As they progressed deeper into the factory, the boss finally revealed the true purpose of the compound's clandestine operations. Here at this facility, you'll be working with a new kind of metal, only recently discovered inside a fallen asteroid. The boss motioned to the center of the plant where a mass of fallen asteroids had impacted into the ground. The space rock was surrounded by thick metal scaffolding. We call it Gold 2, the boss proudly exclaimed. Gold 2, Brett repeated ironically. Not very creative, Katya agreed. Silence, the boss demanded. And yet the boss couldn't silence himself. In fact, he talked much and endlessly to anyone and everyone even three interlopers who had just become his captives. This recently discovered metal, known only as Gold II, is incredibly rare and holds unparalleled properties that make it an invaluable resource. Its conductivity, strength, and resilience surpass any known material, making it a coveted element for the creation of high-speed motherboards used in the most expensive supercomputers. The boss rattled off as if he was reading his words from a business pamphlet. As the boss explained further, Kevin took note of the name on the box of motherboards in the corner. New Island Tech. Kevin's expression sank as he realized that he recognized the name. New Island Tech, Kevin repeated to himself. We use their motherboards in our lab computers. We've been buying from these monsters. Brett nodded in disbelief. It's all right, Kevin. You didn't know. We're pioneers. Our operations are shrouded in secrecy to maintain our advantage against any would-be competitors, the boss explained, his eyes gleaming with a sinister pride. Kevin, despite the dire circumstances, couldn't help but be intrigued by the technological marvel unfolding before him. The compound, disguised as a refining facility, was, in reality, at the forefront of revolutionary advancements in computer technology. Soon the three of you will be put to work, but until then, grab a bunk and a spare radiation suit, the boss demanded. This is your new reality. You'll work alongside all the other wretches refining gold too for 20 hours a day. Fail to comply and your fate will be worse than death. The boss's guards pushed the trio into the next room. The heavy metal door slammed shut behind Kevin Koch and Brett sealing them in a dimly lit room that echoed with the collective murmur of despair. As their eyes adjusted to the subdued lighting, Kevin, Koch, and Brett were confronted by a scene of unspeakable horror. Rows of makeshift cots lined the walls, and hundreds of gaunt figures huddled beside them. One of the figures stepped out from the shadows, revealing her deformed frame. The worker, shackled and emaciated, bore the physical toll of relentless labor and exposure to space radiation. Their hands were callous, their eyes devoid of hope. Their heads and hands were huge. My goodness, Katja gasped. A sense of despondency hung in the air as the boss's captives took in the grim reality of their fellow prisoners. The downtrodden workers cast furtive glasses from their giant heads. As the trio absorbed the heart-wrenching sight, a familiar voice emerged from the shadows. Well, I'll be. Kevin Williams? From behind a distant bunk, Cade Lockwood appeared. Kevin last saw Cade in Laos just after Cade had helped Kevin to escape a prison there. Cade's head and hands were enormous just like the rest of the workers. Cade Lockwood? Kevin inquired. What on earth are you doing here? Cade's enormous head hung low. It's a fair question, Kevin, but a better one is, how are you going to get us out of here? Seeking to free Shrihi's wife from the work camp where she is being held prisoner, Kevin, Koch, and Brett trek to a remote island in a helicopter that is shot down on the orders of the boss, the crazed camp foreman who oversees the mining of a radioactive element from an asteroid. Kevin and his team will become more of his slave labor until they die from their work. Kevin finds old friend Cade Lockwood is another now deformed laborer on the island. Kevin stood face to face with his old friend. Cade, what happened to you? Kevin asked with grave concern. It's a long story. I came here the way most others came here, Cade replied, just looking for a little extra work. 
We didn't know we'd be asked to handle radioactive space metal. I protested. We all protested. But they wouldn't let us stop. They worked us day and night. But what about the radiation suits? Katja inquired. We saw all the workers wearing them when we came in. Shouldn't they protect you? Cade nodded. Like most supplies here, the suits are old and outdated and only protect us for so long. You have to get us out of here, Kevin. Help us. I will, Kevin replied with a firm resolve. But first I need to find someone. The wife of Shriri Kampari. Darika? Cade replied. Darika? Kevin asked. Do you know her? Darika Kampari? I did, Cade responded glumly. But she fell ill. More ill than the rest of us. They took her to the infirmary. Did they say when they expected her back? Fred asked, hopeful. Cade shook his head. Once you go to the infirmary here, he replied as his voice trailed off. Well, you don't ever come back. As the trio considered the grim possibilities, the barrack doors again swung open and the heavily armed foreman called out. All right, you lazy sacks. Time for work. Suit up and head to the line. Dressed in cumbersome radiation suits, Kevin, Katja, and Brett joined the ranks of the oppressed workers on the assembly line. The weight of the suits pressed against their shoulders and the thick material limited their movements. Despite the discomfort, they understood that blending in was essential for unraveling the secrets of the compound. The assembly line stretched out before them like an endless, endless trial of monotony. A rhythmic hum permeated the air as the workers mechanically carried out their tasks of refining the gold too and checking the computer motherboards the ore helped to make after their completion. Kevin, Katja, and Brett, shackled per the demands of the overseers, fell into line, guided by the urgent whispers of their fellow captives. As they looked through the intricate dance of the assembly line, a gaunt woman named Leela took Katja under her wing. Move fast. Don't look back. We have to keep up or we all suffer, Leela muttered, her voice a blend of fatigue and determination. Brett found himself beside a wiry man named Robbie who silently conveyed the urgency of their predicament. You slow down, we all pay the price. Do your part and maybe we can find a way out of this hell together, Robbie whispered, glancing around cautiously. Meanwhile, Kevin in the midst of his own labor exchanged knowing glances with Kay. The unspoken understanding between them conveyed a sense of solidarity amid the oppressive conditions. Hour after hour, the assembly line surged forward, and the trio adapted to the grueling pace. The labor, harsh and dehumanizing, became a crucible for solidarity among the workers, each one tethered to the other by the chains of necessity. During a brief pause in the assembly line, Leela, with beads of sweat clinging to her forehead, leaned toward Katja. There's more to this place than meets the eye. Keep your eyes open and don't trust anyone. We've seen random newcomers brought in unexpectedly before. Most don't last, she warned, her eyes reflecting both fear and resilience. The trio absorbed these snippets of information while navigating the relentless demands of their captors. The oppressive atmosphere in the compound fueled their determination to uncover the truth and liberate their fellow workers. As the assembly line continued its relentless march, Kevin, Katja, and Brett recognized that beneath the facade of mindless labor lay a network of whispered rebellion, a collective yearning for freedom. The trio understood that to dismantle the chains that bound them all, they would need to unravel the secrets of gold too and expose the malevolent forces at play. After 20 hours of continuous labor, the clamor of the assembly line gradually subsided as the workers shuffled away casting off their cumbersome radiation suits like discarded shells. In the dimly lit corners of the compound, the truth behind the facade of Gold II's production was unveiled. As the final echoes of the shift whistle faded, the trio observed the workers in a grim procession, stripping away their protective gear. What emerged from beneath the layers of fabric was a haunting gallery of deformities and afflictions. The once hidden scars of relentless exposure to gold too laid bare once again. Kevin, Katja, and Brett, now stripped of their own radiation suits, blended in with the deformed workers. Their own shock mirrored the silent horror that gripped the assembly hall. Kevin sought to glean more information from the workers. They shared stories of families shattered, dreams extinguished, and the gradual erosion of hope. Each face bore witness to the insidious effects of gold too. 
a medal that promised technological advancement but exacted an unforgiving toll on those who toiled to produce it. As the workers huddled in their shared misery, Kevin, Katja, and Brett realized that the fight for liberation extended beyond the physical confines of the compound. The deformed workers, once vibrant individuals with dreams and aspirations, were now resigned to a fate of perpetual agony. As the workers dispersed to their meager bunks to sleep for a mere few hours, Kevin was left with haunting images of despair all around him. Katja approached Kevin. This is horrible, Katja exclaimed. The worst, Brett added as he too joined the group. How can they expect human beings to work like this? It's a nightmare. What's our move, Kevin? Kevin looked around to make sure no guards were listening. We need to find the infirmary and see if Darika is still there. Katja and Bred nodded in agreement. Kevin, Katja, and Bred navigated the treacherous back halls of the compound, driven to find Darika, and then end this nightmare for all the other workers. The compound's beige, unadorned corridor seemed to stretch endlessly. There, Brett pointed ahead at a simple sign that read plainly, Infirmary. As they approached the dimly lit room, the air grew thick with a sense of foreboding. Kevin peered through a large glass window, catching a glimpse of a very sick woman who lay in a squalid corner, her frail form racked with suffering. Is that Darika? Katja asked. Only one way to find out, Kevin responded. Keep your eyes open. Who knows what could be waiting inside? Pushing open the creaking door, the trio stepped into a chamber of desolation. The infirmary, devoid of any semblance of medical care, resembled more of a forsaken holding cell than a place of healing. The woman Kevin had spotted earlier, weakened and emaciated, lay on a makeshift cot, her hollow eyes gazing into the distance. Kevin approached cautiously. He leaned down and whispered gently, Darika, Darika Kampari? The woman's eyes opened softly. How, how do you know my name? Kevin's expression lifted as he realized that they had found her. We were sent here by your husband, Shrihi, Kevin replied. We promised him we would take you home. Home, Darika repeated. I'll never see my home again. My husband, my daughter... I'm too far gone. No, Kevin countered. You're going to get out of here. You just have to believe. Can you stand? The woman shook her head slightly. I can't move at all. Her head and hands were enormous while the rest of her frame was frail and yellow with sickness. Should we try to move her ourselves? Katja asked. Kevin reached down and took hold of the woman. As he did, she began to vomit violently. What's going on over there? A heavily armed nurse called out from the back room where she smoked cigarettes and played solitaire. Kevin froze, not wanting to set off any alarms. He motioned for his team to back out the way they came. Brett and Katja slowly moved toward the door. Before he left, Kevin leaned down to Darika one last time. Stay alive. We'll be back with a plan. Kevin placed a comforting hand on the woman's cheek and then retreated back outside the infirmary. This is bad, Brett offered. These people... They're all sick. Katja agreed. Even if we had a way to get them off this island, I don't know how many can actually make the trek. They're tired, hungry, and heavily radiated by a space metal we don't know anything about. Kevin considered all the options. His team was right. Things looked grim. We can't give up, Kevin finally replied. We could leave now, fight our way out, but these people, they need our help. So what do we do? Brett asked. I'll follow you anywhere, Kevin. Kevin thought. This is going to be tricky, but we're going to have to heal everyone and then fight our way out. Are you up for it? Brett and Katja shared a look, then turned back to Kevin. Lead the way, Captain, Brett replied. Grateful, Kevin headed down the hall with purpose. The battle had only just begun.